um, yeah, let's start without further ado. So my topic today is walking through the Linux graphics ba um, base stack. Yeah, Linux based graphics stack. Yeah. So um, there are actually other conferences. Uh, one today, I think later, uh, that are also covering the same topic. So I decided to pick a number of, let's say, little known uh, subjects. So yeah, we're gonna see. So. Maybe it's not exactly what you expect or exactly what was in the description, but you're probably still going to learn some stuff. So that's what matters. All right, so who am I? I'm Paul uh, Kosakowski. I am an embedded Linux engineer. I work at a company called Butlin, where we do embedded Linux uh, engineering. Uh, it's mostly a um, service company, so you can hire us if you have some issue to solve about that. And I've been contributing to free software projects, especially in the multimedia and graphics area. So. Um, I worked on a number of V4L2 related drivers, so things like sensors. Um, I've also been working on an ISP driver for the Arduino uh, SOCs, and a little bit on the DRM side as well, so on the, the graphics side, mostly on display controllers and things like that. So also on uh, Arduino, so the Sem Sempry DRM driver. Uh, and I also wrote my own DRM driver, the Logic VC uh, DRM, which is a driver for a specific IP uh, in FPGAs mostly. So um, from Toulouse, southwest of France. Um, what uh, is my topic today? So um, like I said, it's a big picture overview of graphics. So kind of broad, we're going to try to touch on uh, different, different types of, of topics related to graphics. Um, um, I'll start with yeah, kind of a, a general overview. If you guys are not so familiar with graphics, I'm going to give you some, uh, let's say, basic information or some hints. On, on what this is all about. Uh, then we're going to see a little bit about early graphics, so what happens at boot, um, how, yeah, how all of that works, and then a little bit more on a running system. So um, yeah, more like general typical use case of, of graphics with Linux. Um, like I said, I'm going to shed some light on little known aspects, so things that are yeah, usually not, not really well known or, or, or kind of hidden under the hood. So yeah. Um, I'll do that and also try to give you references to popular free software projects, so things like Western or the Linux kernel, to kind of give you uh, some pointers on where you can look if you want to have more details on some specific area that I'm mentioning. You can uh, basically look at the files and the functions that I'm listing so you can actually see how it's done and, and the actual code that runs. So let's start with that big picture overview. So the first thing I wanted to mention is how um, graphics um, uh, pixels are stored. So we have this notion of frame buffer, which is really just a word to describe the memory area where the, uh, the pixels are stored. Um, and that memory area can actually be in, in different places. There are different situations. So the first one is that we use system memory, which is the general memory, the general DRAM of your system, and we store the pixels there. And then we have some hardware that's going to access that memory. But we can also have dedicated graphics memory. For example, in your graphics card, you will have um, something called VRAM, which is video RAM. It's just uh, memory that's dedicated to the purpose of graphics. So it's usually attached to the GPU, for example, or to the graphics card. Um, so this is not handled the same in, in on the software side, of course. So you have to know about these uh, differences. And there's also the fragmentation uh, case. So Basically, you can have your memory that is contiguously stored in physical memory. So it means that you have a large area of your RAM uh, that contains the frame buffer in one, um, in one block, let's say. Or it can be fragmented uh, using paging. Uh, in that case, you need some memory mapping units um, to be able to basically create a, a virtual, virtually contiguous buffer from uh, physically fragmented memory. So you will have just pages that are scattered here and there on your memory and your mapping unit will uh, put that back as one contiguous virtual uh, buffer. And that can exist uh, on the CPU side, that can exist on your device side as well. So you can have a uh, page or fragmented memory for your GPU, for your display engine, for example. So on the CPU side, that requires a MMU, as you probably know, and on the uh, device side, you have the equivalent called an IO MMU, which is also doing the same task of translating between physical and, and virtual memory. Uh, one thing I also wanted to mention is that there are um, no metadata stored in your frame buffers. So you always have to know um, the format of the pixels because of course there are lots of different formats to represent the pixels. Uh, you have to know something called the modifier, which is uh, basically the order in which the pixels are stored in memory. 
uh, that can be linear order, which is the typical uh, top left uh, line after line uh, storage, but that can be something different uh, for various reasons. Uh, you can also have compressions, etc. So the point is, um, frame buffer is really just the data, and you have to know like how that data is encoded uh, on the side. So it's always some um, uh, information that you need to carry along with the pointer to your memory. So yeah. Uh, I mentioned the uh, DMA, uh, oh no, not the DMA actually. So DMA is a way for your devices to directly access your memory. Um, and so the CPU doesn't have to uh, fetch the memory, uh, fetch the data from memory and push it to the device, but the device can actually go and uh, pull it from memory by itself. Uh, so that is better for um, performance and latency and, and things like that. So that's one thing uh, that needs to be implemented for efficient graphics access graphics memory access, and there's also the um, um, bus mapping that might be an issue. For example, if you uh, have a graphics card that's on PCI and it has memory on board, then your CPU needs a way to map that memory uh, to its physical or virtual memory at, uh, address range and to be able to access that memory. So you have to do those bus mapping operations. Um, and another uh, topic on memory is cache. So uh, for example, when your CPU is going to write to a memory area, to a frame buffer, uh, it's possible that the write actually stays in the cache of the CPU, so you have to be very careful about cache synchronization points to flush the memory at the correct time and to invalidate memory before you read it at the correct time as well. So these are all topics that you need to take care of when you're dealing with graphics memory. So that just gives you an idea of uh, the topics involved. That was quickly for the memory side. Now I'm going to spend a bit a bit of time on, on display. So there are a number of different components that are chained in a typical uh, display chain. So it all starts with the frame buffer here. So that's where we have our memory. And then we have a number of components uh, that allow us to send that memory to an actual display. So the next one uh, in line is called the plane. Um, it's part of the uh, mixing process. So basically, uh, we have that memory and we might want to apply some operations to it. For example, we might want to rotate it, to scale it, uh, we can crop it, we can convert its format, things like that. Um, and we can have one plane or multiple planes. So we can actually have multiple inputs to the display hardware. Um, so multiple frame buffers that will be composited together by the display hardware itself. Uh, the point is that at the end we want to have a unique uh, a unique picture uh, that will be sent over to the monitor because the monitor is a single surface, it doesn't have multiple layers. So if you have multiple layers as input, you need to composite them together um, uh, with those planes. So uh, once they are composited, they go to the CRTC, uh, which is really the timings generator. So it will make sure that the data is sent to the next stage at a uh, particular rate following specific timings. Uh, so typically nowadays we send uh, 60 times per second the image over to the display. So it's that uh, CRTC component here that is in charge of uh, um, applying this, um, this fetching rate. So um, after that we go on to the encoder. So uh, it's a FIFO uh, between those stages. Then we have the encoder which actually shapes the data uh, in the um, uh, physical format for the display interface. So for example if you're using HDMI uh, you have an HDMI encoder which will receive the pixels and format them to the actual physical lane of HDMI, which is uh, some differential signaling TMDS. Uh, so you need a component for that, that's the encoder. Then you might have another one which is not always there, but w which can exist, it's the bridge. Uh, this one is about translating between one display interface to another. Uh, for example, if you're using VGA uh, nowadays, there's no uh, actual VGA encoder in your um, uh, display pipeline uh, on your um, um, device, on your SOC or your CPU or whatever has a display engine. Uh, instead, you'll have some output like HDMI or DisplayPort, and then you have a bridge uh, which will convert from that interface to VGA. So it's also very common. And then finally, we have our panel or monitor. So the panel would be more like an embedded display panel uh, for an embedded case, and the monitor is more like uh, a full-fledged monitor with a HDMI cable and, and different inputs and things like that. So that's basically the chain for uh, display. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, rendering. So nowadays we mostly use the GPU for rendering, pretty much uh, everything that's happening uh, 
actually both on your typical laptop or desktop and on embedded use cases, um, all of the rendering operations will most likely be done by the GPU. Um, so a GPU is really a very complex beast that uh, can render 3D, but it can also be used in 2D use cases. And uh, even when we have hardware on the side that exists, for example, for vector drawing or uh, pixel mixers as well, um, those those uh, hardware blocks tend not to be used in favor of the GPU, uh, which is um, typically because of APIs, uh, because we have great APIs for uh, driving the GPU, but not so much for the, the other types of uh, rendering, 2D rendering blocks. So people tend to always use the GPU because the APIs are easier to use. Uh, there's a downside, of course. Uh, it's that the uh, GPU consumes a lot of energy. It's uh, quite complex. It has um, um, a significant latency, one could say, um, especially because uh, GPUs work uh, as programmable pipelines. So a GPU is actually a kind of a very specialized CPU with its own instruction set. It can actually have multiple instruction sets. And along its rendering pipeline, so its internal pipeline, it's going to run small programs that we call shaders. Oh, sorry. Uh, and so we have different types of shaders for different things. And uh, uh, those programs actually need to be compiled from a source description that is provided by the uh, application that wants to use the GPU. Uh, so that's why it, it's quite complex. It's pretty much like uh, its own uh, computer on its own, pretty much. So it's, it's pretty big. Uh, keep that in mind when you have to choose between a dedicated hardware block for something or using the GPU. Uh, the GPU is kind of a... a uh, yeah, huge piece that will solve your problem, but at a cost, which is uh, power, latency, and complexity. Okay, so uh, now we've covered display, render, a little bit about memory. So uh, let me tell you about uh, Linux kernel related stuff, because that's why we're here. So let's start with the, um, um, the display APIs. So uh, basically the kernel has two uh, display APIs. The first one is called FBDev or Frame Buffer Device. It's considered legacy. It's a pain in the neck. We really want to get rid of it, but we can't for a number of reasons that I'm going to mention. Uh, but keep in mind that this is an old interface that is mostly fit for hardware that came out in the 1990s, but nowadays it's fully uh, outdated. Uh, it has so many issues, so please don't use it. And instead we have DRM, which is like the new uh, subsystem of the kernel, the new framework that has all of the great features that we want to use. Um, and DRM is actually pretty big. Uh, it has multiple different parts. Um, the one related to display is called KMS. So that's the user space API that we want to use to actually display things. So to coordinate the frame buffers and the whole display pipeline that I was mentioning. Um, there's an extension of it called Atomic, which allows uh, basically grouping changes to the display hardware together so that you can have uh, basically, yeah, changes happening all at once, which wasn't possible with the previous KMS API. Uh, there's a block called Gem, uh, which is in charge of uh, the memory management, so all the things I mentioned on the previous slide about the uh, cache synchronization, about the bus mapping, etc. All of that is done in, in Gem. Uh, it also supports some user space APIs for things like zero copy, where you want to import memory that already exists into your graphics device. Uh, you can use this prime API of DRM. Uh, there's also fences, which allow for explicit synchronization points between graphics devices, and we have this sync obj um, API as well. And finally, there's the render part of DRM, uh, which is a bit uh, different because it's not like a unified API between all of your drivers, but it's actually um, uh, kind of a base building block on the kernel side. But, but on the UAPI side, uh, it's um, basically one API per driver. So each driver has its own API to render. That's because it mostly targets GPUs, which are highly specific, and it doesn't really make sense to have like a generic interface for all of them. So each have their own interface. And there's a library called libdrm that you can use in user space to kind of interact with, with all of these components um, with like call, uh, well, basically IOCTL wrappers, so it's just kind of a convenience library. Um, yeah, that was for the kernel side. Now we move on to user space, and uh, we can talk about display server APIs. So um, probably you've heard about the uh, X11 and, and Wayland display server implementation. So they are actually 
protocols. Uh, X11 and Wayland are protocols. So they are a way for applications to coordinate submitting their buffers and getting input events uh, from a central location, which is the display server or display compositor. So X11 is now considered legacy, uh, also has various issues, and the up-to-date standard is now Wayland, uh, which supports lots of uh, great features and actually does things the right way. Um, they also have associated libraries uh, that you can use for your application to interact with those display servers. So on the X11 side, there's Xlib and Xcd. Uh, Xlib is the old one, Xcd is kind of newer and kind of uh, easier to use. And on the uh, Wayland side, it's more like thin wrappers for the uh, communication protocol between the uh, clients, the applications, and the display server. Um, we also have graphics toolkits like Qt, GTK, or EGL, which are um, basically um, just, um, well, they, they wrap the um, display server APIs, so they are easier to use for applications. You don't have to care about the details of whether you're running on X or Wayland or even Windows uh, or of something else. You can just use these um, toolkits. And they also provide, uh, in most cases, some uh, rendering, UI rendering abilities and input management. So, for example, we talk about widget-based toolkits. Uh, the widgets are uh, really some graphic elements that you can add to your application. So it really makes it easier to build your graphical application instead of having to draw the pixels yourself. Now, um, let's talk about 2D rendering. So there's a lot to do in terms of 2D rendering. So a um, number of libraries exist for that, uh, that are commonly used uh, with the other um, software that I mentioned, so basically on, on Linux-based stacks. Um, Cairo and Skia are there to do vector drawing, so really to draw base shapes, uh, things like that. So Skia is the one developed by Google. For example, it's used to render the Chrome or Chromium uh, web browser, so yeah, that's what it does. Um, you also have other libraries that allow you to manipulate pixels. So for example, if you need to do some pixel format conversion, uh, scaling or things like that, rotation or even more advanced stuff, uh, these libraries are really commonly used for, for that. Then there is font rendering, which is another big aspect of 2D rendering. Uh, of course, if you want to create a user interface, you want to have fonts or text shown, so you need some library to do that. Uh, the two main ones are FreeType, which is kind of the old, uh, longest standing one, and half buzz, which is the newer rewrite by Google as well, uh, to do font rendering. So with that, you can basically just give it some memory and uh, some input text, and it will provide the pixels that correspond to that text uh, with a given font. So that's font rendering. And uh, in terms of UI rendering, I mentioned the graphics toolkits already, so like Qt, GTK, things like that. And you also have some immediate mode um, user interface rendering, like IMGUI on Nuclear. Uh, these um, basically won't deal with the uh, display server side of things. They will just pr produce a user interface in memory. Uh, so, yeah, that's a kind of a different approach to UI rendering. So with all of these components, we have everything we need to actually create user interfaces. Um, 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 yeah, so. Yeah. That was for 2D. Now let's move on to 3D. We have a number of uh, APIs that are used. The most uh, well-known ones uh, and used ones are OpenGL, OpenGL ES. So that's the uh, APIs to actually do the 3D rendering to configure everything needed to render a 3D scene. Uh, it's kind of high level, uh, meaning that you don't have to deal with all of the actual complexity of the rendering process. It will abstract things a little and it will make life easier for you. Uh, you can provide shaders, so the little, pro the little programs that run in the rendering pipelines. Uh, you provide them as source in the GLSL uh, format, shading language, so it's a little bit like C, uh, so it's yeah, just a, a, a programming language for shaders. Um, then we have EGL, uh, which is basically in charge of doing the glue between the rendering side, so between the OpenGL and the uh, uh, display server integration, so that you can directly display the buffers that you have rendered with the GPU uh, using the d display server API. And then uh, the new one that, well, it's not so new anymore, but uh, most recent one, I would say, is Vulkan, uh, which is kind of a um, more advanced approach uh, 
uh, to 3D rendering. So it's just also an API that you can use in your program to generate 3D um, uh, images, uh, but it's lower level and it requires you to do a lot more things than OpenGL to do um, um, 3D rendering. Of course, it means that it has greater potential for optimization, so it's preferred in a number of cases. And the shaders that it takes are no longer a source language, but they are in kind of a pre-compiled form, uh, which is called SPUR-V. And this pre-compiled form is called the intermediate representation uh, for the shaders. Uh, in terms of implementations, so these are, are not uh, software implementations, they are APIs. And we have implementations which are either Mesa 3D, the reference free software one for 3D rendering, or you can also have proprietary implementations uh, which are typically hardware specific and provided by the manufacturer of the GPU, for instance. Uh, and they have various issues uh, due to the fact that they are proprietary. So there are security issues, there are you know, maintainability issues, compatibility issues. So yeah, it's really usually a, a big pain in the neck to deal with those, but they exist and we sometimes have to use them. So that's that. Um, that's for a kind of summary diagram on all of this. Um, so we have our applications here that might use the toolkits to talk to the display server. Uh, they might also use the 2D or 3D rendering stuff. Uh, the toolkits might also, also use them because the toolkits will also be in charge of rendering um, uh, elements. Uh, the display server might also need to use them, for example, to do the uh, compositing of the different buffers from the applications. I'll get back to that a bit later if I have time. Um, <coughs> yeah, that, that's for the user space side. Uh, on the kernel side, we find our three main APIs. So DRMK MS for the display part. So it's related to the display server. So the display server will push its frame buffer to KMS. Uh, Mesa 3D will use DRM render to access the uh, GPU um, rendering features. And both will use DRM gem internally to manage the, uh, all the memory related uh, aspects. So yeah, that's how it goes. And then we have the hardware uh, at the end. So KMS for the display, like I said, DRM for the memory and render for the GPU. And of course, uh, these, comp these components, display and GPU will do DMA to directly access the memory. So yeah, that's kind of the summary of the stack. Uh, now we're going to move on to some uh, specific topics. Uh, Want to talk about the frame buffer console, which is kind of the first thing we see when we uh, uh, start a system. So the idea is that we have a component called FBCon, which is basically a bridge between a generic TTY or virtual terminal interface and the frame buffer side. So this is what allows you to have uh, like a terminal shown on screen. And uh, this can be useful for showing the kernel boot logs, for example. Uh, this can be useful when you have an encrypted root file system and you need a way to enter your password. Um, so you need to use this, uh, this uh, FBCon bridge here that will allow you to actually uh, enter some input uh, and see something on the screen. So it's enabled with this configuration option. You can also display a logo there. Um, yeah, that's, that's that. And so in order to use that, you actually need a frame buffer device driver. So uh, using FBDev, not KMS. Uh, so that's actually why the FBDev subsystem is still alive because we need it for FBDev. Um, and so that frame buffer can come either from the boot software, uh, which might already have allocated a frame buffer and configured the display. So you can basically inherit that. Or you can have a, um, a dedicated uh, driver uh, for your hardware, which will be a FBDEV driver. Of course, nowadays, no one writes new FBDEV drivers, but um, uh, it might be the case that you have one. Uh, and otherwise, we have a compatibility layer between DRM KMS and FBDEV, which um, uh, allows providing the FBDEV API so that uh, uh, FBCon can use it to display some, something on the screen. So basically, if you have a DRM KMS driver, then you have FBCon thanks to this compatibility layer. So that's some references that I'm uh, giving here if you want to look a little bit more about the details of how it works. I'll skip that. Um, quickly, the boot splash. So the boot splash is basically a, an application that runs in the initramfs that uh, will just show something on the screen. So it will use one of the display APIs of the kernel, so either FBDEV or KMS. And it's basically nicer for users to have some graphical feedback of the system booting rather than a text console, which is what FBDEV directly is. Uh, 
Uh, so moving on to the running system. Um, so I mentioned this FVCon, um, which uh, basically is an internal user of the frame buffer in the kernel. So FVCon uh, will bind to your frame buffer driver and it will show its text console basically. Uh, but as soon as user space starts, it actually wants to display uh, its own buffer instead. So we kind of need a way to coordinate between uh, FBCon and that um, um, user space user, uh, well, yeah, that user space client of the display device. Uh, so this is called, uh, well, this is, this is done with VT mode. So basically, um, uh, FBCon uh, is, bo is bound to a a specific TTY, and you can apply some IOC tools to that TTY to ask to detach it. Okay, so there are two modes, uh, text mode and graphics mode. So in text mode, uh, VB FBCon will be attached to the virtual terminal, and uh, in graphics mode, it's detached, and then a user space program can start using the, um, uh, the display uh, side. Uh, thing that happens is, um, yeah, I think it's the next slide. Yeah, VT switching. So um, I mentioned that FBCon um, is that bridge uh, between the virtual terminal and the graphics side. Uh, but you can actually have multiple virtual terminals. And you can switch them using Control alt and the function keys on your keyboard. So maybe you've seen that um, at boot, you start on TTY1, but you have a number of them. So you can switch to TTY2 with Control alt F2, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so this is called VT switching. And um, when you are only uh, running FBCon, it's fine because FBCon will keep track of uh, which VT is currently active, so it works. But as soon as you have a user space program that starts using the, the, the um, that starts using graphics, uh, when you want to switch to a different uh, virtual terminal, you actually need cooperation with that program to ask it to release the, um, the resources, to release the display use, so that FBCon can get back to uh, being active on the new on the new virtual terminal that you have switched to. So this is done uh, using signals. So basically, the application will register specific signals that the kernel will send to that application to ask it to release uh, the display. And uh, when you basically switch back to the virtual terminal of that application, it will notify it that now we can acquire the display back. So there is this switching mechanism. Um, that is done through um, uh, signals that are registered with this VT set mode uh, IOC tool. So it means that basically you can have multiple graphics sessions running in parallel, and uh, this wasn't so much the case with X because uh, of internal limitations, but now with Wayland, you can have one Wayland session running on each of your virtual terminals, so you can have multiple ones in parallel. Uh, this is typically what happens with login manager. So you have the login manager that pops up at boot and then it will start an, uh, a graphic session for your user on a different virtual terminal and you can have uh, many more like that. So that's the references again. Um, now I wanted to mention systemd login D, um, which is basically, <coughs> um, yeah, it's basically a way to allow display servers to run without uh, increased privileges because uh, actually configuring the graphics pipeline uh, requires uh, root privileges. And so um, some time ago, if you wanted to have a graphics session for your user, you needed to have the display server run as root, which was uh, an issue for security. So now we have a component provided by systemd, which is called systemd login D. And it will basically open the file descriptor of the um, DRM KMS device and provide it to an application through a Unix socket. So it will pass on the file descriptor through that Unix socket. And then the application can receive that privileged fi file descriptor, but it doesn't have to run as root uh, globally. So this is implemented with a Dbus uh, service here. Uh, and any application can, uh, yeah, well, just one, actually one application can request uh, to have the DRM KMS file descriptor and then can configure the display pipeline. And it does the same with the VT operations. Uh, so uh, that's also a privileged operation to uh, switch the mode from text to graphics. And so systemd login D will also do that for you. And you just have to use the Dbus interface. And then your display server can uh, stop running as root, which is uh, nice for security and other reasons. So that's a code highlight. Um, I'll skip the login manager because I'm running out of time. And yeah, we're going to move on to uh, 
um, the display server side. So how do applications actually submit their uh, pixels to the display server? Uh, well, they don't actually transfer the pixels, so we are not like copying the whole frame buffers from the application's uh, memory to the display server. Instead, we want to use uh, zero copy buffer sharing. So most of that is done through file descriptors. Uh, mainly, there are two approaches. Uh, the first one is uh, shared memory, SHM. Uh, so you can basically allocate um, anonymous memory uh, on the application side, you'll get a file descriptor for that. Uh, you fill in your pixels in that, and then you will uh, share that file descriptor with the display server, and the display server will read from that memory. So you just have one memory location, there's no duplication, there's no transfer, and then, of course, you have better performance, uh, reduced latency, etc. So SHM is the case when uh, you draw the contents using the CPU, so for example, using one of the 2D rendering libraries that I mentioned. Uh, but if you're using the GPU for rendering, then you're going to use a different API, and that's when EGL comes in. So I mentioned that it was the glue between the rendering side and the um, display server. So that's uh, typically when it comes into play. Uh, it will allow you to share uh, a reference to a buffer between your application and the display server. Um, the, these um, 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 APIs uh, or ways of sharing buffers also imply that uh, you have to deal with the allocation um <coughs> through these APIs. So it means that if you have already existing memories, you'll need a special way to import that memory into your device and then maybe share it with the uh, display server. So for example, on, e uh, on EGL, you have this extension here, which uses the DMA buff mechanism um, that allows you to import existing memory and uh, have it described as a file descriptor, and then you can share that with your display server, uh, which will then be able to read from that memory. So the typical case for that would be, uh, for example, that you uh, have a camera um, supported by V4L2, which is another uh, API of the kernel, and uh, you will do a DMA buff export on that V4L2 device, you will get a file descriptor, and then you will import that uh, through this um, um, extension here, through this call. And so what it does is that it will import that memory to the GPU device, which can then access the memory uh, that was used by the V4L2 camera, uh, and then you don't have any uh, copy required. And you can, uh, again, just... Um, address the same memory. There can be some uh, access issues, but it's typically not the case. For example, if uh, your camera has an IOMU and it can deal with fragmented memory, but your GPU can't, well, it's typically the other way around, but for this, for, for this example, let's do it that way. Uh, if your memory is fragmented uh, and your GPU is not able to uh, um, create a virtually contiguous representation of that buffer, then there's no way that it's going to be able to use that memory as an input for whatever it has to do. So that's a kind of incompatibility that can occur. But generally speaking, in uh, well-designed systems, uh, you'll typically find equivalent capabilities on those different devices. And so what you are able to export on one, on one side, you can typically import on the other side. So that works. Um, so that's all for uh, basically sharing the memory between the application and the display server. Um, and there are, uh, that, that's one thing that you need to do, but you also need to let the display server know uh, when something has changed on the screen so that it can redraw that part. So this is called um, surface damaging. Uh, so the application will say that this area of the buffer was updated at one point in time after it has shared the buffers. So for example, on Wayland, we have this WL surface damage call here that is uh, responsible for that. And then you can also um, tell the display server that uh, you have finished your changes to the uh, buffer. So for example, you can have multiple damage regions because you have up updated multiple parts of the buffer. And then uh, you will tell the display server that, uh, okay, now my changes are done and you can um, um, start updating the uh, full view of the, the, the display uh, with that buffer. So this is the surface commit call uh, here on, on Wayland as well. <coughs>
So here you find some references as well on, on uh, yeah, how pixels are actually submitted in different cases. So the first one is uh, the uh, SHM case, the first two ones actually, and that's uh, EGL, so when you want to use the GPU, and that's DMA buff EGL, so in that case you're going to import external memory into EGL um, in that situation. So that's it. Uh, next step is compositing. So like I pretty much mentioned, the display server will grab or it will gather multiple buffers from multiple applications and it is in charge of creating a unique uh, uh, buffer that it can submit to the display like using KMS typically. So it needs to gather all of these uh, buffers. This is called compositing and it is a very demanding task. Uh, so this is why we have those damage regions to avoid redrawing the whole buffer at every frame. Instead, we just want to update the minimal parts uh, of it. And this typically has to be hardware accelerated because it's so demanding that if you were to do this on the CPU, your CPU will be running all the time just doing that and it would barely be able to catch up with the 60 hertz refresh rate that we have for the display. So keep in mind that compositing is very demanding and you typically need a GPU for that, even though there are some software implementations that can be enough for simple cases, but uh, yeah, it's still very demanding. So uh, references as well. And the final part that I wanted to mention is page flipping. So page flipping is basically when we submit a, f a finalized composited frame buffer uh, to the display um, uh, pipeline. Uh, and one effect that can uh, typically occur is called tearing. It's when um, it's basically when the display server will try to update the buffer and the display uh, pipeline, so the hardware will read that buffer at the same time. So then you have a concurrency issue and what you might get on your screen is a half updated buffer. So that will result in a visual glitch, which is not great. So one solution that we have uh, to prevent that is called double buffering. So we'll have two buffers, uh, one that is currently active for scan out, which is when the display pipeline is reading from that buffer, and a second buffer where we can uh, do our composition, our rendering, and um, when the composition is done, we are going to flip those buffers. So this is called uh, page flipping. Uh, this is when we exchange the world of those two buffers, and that can only happen when um, when the display scanout is uh, uh, it has basically finished writing, uh, uh, sending the previous frame, and it has not yet started uh, sending the next one. So this is when we page flip, and so when it starts reading the the next buffer to send it to the display interface, then it has the new buffer that was uh, updated and composited. So. This way, we never have this half updated state that cause tearing. Uh, instead, we just have one clean buffer uh, that is on for uh, uh, display scanout that we don't touch. We update a different buffer and then we switch them uh, at the right time. And uh, this is done through, again, the DRM KMS API. Uh, we have two IOCTOs for that page flip, uh, which uh, is a little bit legacy and atomic, which uses the atomic uh, new API uh, for that. And we can also get an event to know when the page flip has actually occurred. So these are the code highlights and yeah, that's it for me. Sorry, it was very dense. I hope you still got uh, something out of that. So thank you everyone. Maybe you have time, yeah, for one or two questions. Yeah, sure. Thanks. You mentioned um, the double buffering that gives you more buffers that increase latency. Is double buffering enough to boost latency because you don't need as much? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, does uh, having triple buffering up reduce latency by not needing to block uh, and always having a, the latest, or at least when there's a completed frame being moved uh, right before the display plane? Yeah, so there can be different uh, situations for that. I was thinking of a case where your rendering is really not, not the bottleneck of your uh, pipeline. So if you can render very fast, if you render in advance, you increase latency because the frame that you produce was produced at a, a time that is farther away uh, from the point that it will be displayed than if you use double buffering. So for example, in a video game, if you render three frames in advance, it means that if you move the mouse, it will take at least three frames uh, to have impact on the display. So that's in that sense that it increases latency. Uh, in other situations, for example, for video decoding, it might be a good idea to decode in advance because um, 
the frames that you decode are not going to change because they come from a file or something like that. So in this case, yes, if you decode in advance and decoding is your actual bottleneck, uh, then it might give you some extra room in terms of catching up with the frame rate. Uh, so if your decoding is a bit slow, then indeed you have more interest in decoding in advance and doing more than double buffering, but triple or, or four, five, six buffers, as many as you want, uh, because then you can start decoding a bit before you start displaying, and then you have kind of a backlog of, of buffers that are ready and that you can submit directly without having to wait uh, for the decode uh, to finish. So it really depends what's the bottleneck and what's your situation. So in the general case, I would say that it kind of adds uh, um, um, latency in that case, but from the decoding perspective, it's, it's a bit different, so yeah. Okay, I think it's a wrap, uh, sorry. So what is the status of latency? It's very good, you should use it, yeah. <laughs> So thank, sorry. Yes. Yeah, distros are using it. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. it's ready for use. Yeah. Okay, that's a wrap. Sorry, guys. Uh, thank you, everyone. And yeah.